power to the people. We're here for a joyous occasion. It's a dark history, but we're here and have survived, and we're here to celebrate the survival and the forward march. Give me a little bit of something, something, bro. Give me a little something, something. Take us back. A little something, something. Take us back. Get that feeling. See, I'm good. Follow the instructions. Everybody turn off your phone. I hope I got it right. Bring our guests forward. Our honorees. Everybody. Stand and give them. Welcome. It's my favorite council woman. <laughs> Sister Willa. She wrote. Hell. out of Africa, that's all of our roots. <laughs> that's all of our roots. And in that tradition, maybe we could all stand and begin our program with the singing of Black National Anthem, get brought to us by James Weldon Johnson. And we're gonna just do the first, the first verse, and everything we do has gotta be tight, because we got a lot on the program, and we got a limited amount of time. Who's gonna lead us? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Maestro. <laughs> Boy, we gotta we gotta pay this. We gotta pay this. Heaven ring, ring with the harm Yeah. 
want to welcome our most gracious host, the Right Reverend Simmons. I'm a big hand. Come on, get it. This is our mentor, our sponsor, our supporter. You didn't know how grateful we are. Before I do welcome, can you stay standing just a moment? Before I do welcome, uh, will you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you now for Larry Hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for saving his life. Thank you for sending him back to us. Yes, sir. We pray, Lord, that you continue to bless him. That's right. That he might go toward a speedy recovery. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then, Lord, we pray that he follow directions that have been given to him by his doctors and his pastor and others so that his body will have time to heal so that he will be made whole again so that when he comes back to us he will come back as a whole leader bless pop and all the work that it does and all the people that it represents it is in Jesus name we do pray and everybody said amen. amen. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say tonight that on, on behalf of Abyssinian Baptist Church, on behalf of the Baptist Ministers Conference of Newark and Vicinity, and on behalf of the Black Ministers Council of the State of New Jersey, I want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, you here tonight as you come to celebrate Women's Month. And um, so many times we try to diminish the importance that, of the roles that women play in our lives. And um, I often remind my son that he has a mother and that he has sisters. And I always treat women the way he wants his mother and his sisters to be treated. The Bible says, in the image of God, he created man, and in his image, he created them, both man and woman. So women are created in God's image just as men are, and we come tonight to honor womanhood. We come to honor the women, the matriarchs in our lives at whatever level they stand. I want to thank God for uh, Mrs. Rudolph coming all the way from Alabama. Her husband and her husband for, for making the trip with us. When we were in the back, he was thanking us for bringing them. But I want to thank them for honoring us with their presence. Amen. And um, let me just say that your meeting place tonight is a little different than where you've been that you meet most of the time. Amen. You, you're in the sanctuary. And uh, you ought to know how to behave yourselves in the sanctuary. Uh, just pretend you're in your mosque or your, you know, what, your, your temple, wherever, and, and behave yourselves accordingly. Because I'm not going to stay with you during the service, and if y'all don't act right, they're not going to say nothing to you. They'll say it to me. And so if you really love me, y'all guard the sanctuary. Amen. Amen. Now, I did bring out some water uh, for our president so that he can, you know, uh, make sure he doesn't, you know, get dehydrated. But no food and drink is allowed in the sanctuary. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. So, uh, if you want to eat, you know, there are plenty of tables downstairs. Just take your five-minute break and go down and eat because I know some of us on medication and we have to eat a little something and take that. And we understand that. And let me just say how important it is that you stay inside here as often as you can because every time you open the door, you know, everything that's said and done in here is heard everywhere. The, the doors are kind of like your buffer, and there's prayer meeting going on in room A, there's choir rehearsal, and the choir gave up this sanctuary so you could be here tonight. And so I want to thank the senior choir, amen, for that. But just know you are always welcome to Abyssinian Baptist Church. And, um, amen, and, um, and, and, and if you wanna know how I feel about this organization, I'm a member of this organization. 
And, and I'm not a, and I, I don't join nothing that I don't put my heart into. And I pray for you all always that God will continue to lead and direct you uh, in the way that he would have you go. You say power to the people, I say power to the people, and all glory to God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Simmons. Give the Reverend Simmons another hand, please. My co-vice chair, Sister Mary Weaver, for a pop welcome. Please welcome her. Power to the people. Thank everyone for coming to this most historical event tonight of POPs um, Women's History Month. We are honored with Ms. Sarah Collins Rudolph, who is a part of history. And tonight, you all will become a part of history, just like I will. And I'm so proud to be in their presence. People's Organization Pro Progress is uh, glad to have you here. And we're glad that you are members. I see a lot of members out there. And your support is always welcome. We always appreciate your support and all that you do for People's Organization for Progress and our chairman, Larry Hamm. Thank you, and have a good evening. And if you're not a member, please get a membership brochure. Sign on up and become part of the POP family. Um, in addition to the particular sheroes that we have cited, we also want to celebrate all women in this month who have engaged in the struggle against the oppression of women and for the emancipation of the human race. So it's not just, you know, we like women. We learn, we are nurtured by those sheroes who have led the fight for the emancipation of the family, for emancipation of women, for emancipation of the human race. And we here we're glad to recognize, and as Reverend Simmons pointed out, too often it is downplayed. But we gonna recognize real history and celebrate it and make some real history tonight. So give yourselves a hand. Because we're here to celebrate the leaders and the followers and the participants and the unsung who make the movement and change the world. That's y'all. Queen Mother of Marco. Give us a libation, please. I need me to hold something. I'd like the elders' permission to speak. Yes. Well, thank you. I am uh, Reverend Dr. Queen Mother Imaku. I'm a proud member of the People's Organization for Progress right. and a proud active member. I give thanks and praises that our brother chairman, as we lovingly know him, brother chairman Ham is here with us. Goodness knows you had so many people from everywhere praying for you, including around the globe, people associated with Akeru Temple of the True Living Waters. And you are so beloved. We're so, so grateful that you're here. Thank you. I would like to ask for uh, an elder, woman to come forward and a young woman to come forward. So are we identifying as youth or elder? No, that's I'm playing with you. <laughs> okay. If you could please hold this. Okay. All right. And okay. all right, if you could please step this way. If you would please hold this. You as the elder will be pouring into the vessel of the youth because we receive wisdom from our elders, you see, okay? The act of libation goes all the way back to ancient Africa, to ancient Kemet, where it is called Kepu. And we remember as we pour that we are connected to the divine river of ancestors, our ancestral blood that we carry, which is cast forward into the future. We have the past represented and today and the future. This uh, 
language I'll be sharing this in, and I'll be translating it as I go along, is in our ancient tongue. This is no disrespect to the beautiful home here, uh, but this is just a matter of history. Culturally and historically, the comedic language uh, and traditions helped to birth the tradition of this house. And uh, the elements live within all of us. We remember the ancestors. Sharer Kebhu Chirchu, ancestor libation prayer. M Chirchu, to the ancestors. Teges Nu, we follow your footsteps. Duau, many thanks to you. Er Chenduku, you give us light. Er Nuku, we give you light. We give our ancestors light by our just actions by the love that we show the community and to family. And as we live righteously, we help to elevate them and they continue to flow into us with their positive whisperings and guidance. Setnu kebu, we pour libation. Ishkanu, we remember you. Keru rene chenu, we speak your names. Let us now, as we pour, first speak the names of all of the women in your family who had great influence over you, who are now in the ancestral realm. Great. Call their names. Give thanks. Selma Whitley. Grace. Give thanks. And now, because we believe also in balance, call the names of all of the fathers and the men who have had great influence in your lives. Andrew Whitley, Tommy Lloyd, Billy Artis, give thanks and praises. And let us remember also the four little girls who have long time been in the ancestral realm, as well as all the others who have sacrificed their lives for the movement. Mernu Hetepu, we wish you peace and blessings. Mernu Sharem, we wish you peace and freedom. Ernu Merea, we give you love. Duau, many thanks to you. Duau, duau, duau. In this past year, we lost a favorite son of Nork and a leader in the liberation struggle of our people, and that's the whole human race, but a leader in particular in the struggle for liberation of the oppressed Afro-American people, and that's comrade brother Amiri Baraka, who we honor and remember his contributions to our own development and to the advancement of our struggle. And he's going to be part of this program, the Celebration and Recognition of Women. Sister Susan, who's your hostess this evening, is going to play for us by Amiri Baraka, Beautiful Black Woman, a poem. I think. <laughs> if we whistle a few bars, will it? <laughs> Lipstick. 
break out perpetually at our weakness. Raining, stop them. Black queens. Ruby B weeps at the window, raining, being lost in her life. Being what we all will be, sentimental, bitter, frustrated, deprived of her fullest life. Beautiful black women, it is still raining in this terrible land. We need you. We flex our muscles, turn to stare at our tormentor. We need you. Black ladies wander. Ruby D weeps. The window raining. She calls, and her voice is left to hurt us slowly. It hangs against the same wet glass. Her sadness and age, and the trip, and the lost heat, and the gray cold buildings of our entrapment. Ladies, women, we need. You. We are still trapped and weak, but we build and grow heavy with our knowledge. Women, come to us. Help us get back what was always ours. Help us, women. Where are you, women? Where and who and where? Thank you, sister. Word Smith Supreme from Brick City. POP wants to recognize a few people. We have a main honoree, but our historian chaired a study group, Brother Amanifu Williams, going to come forward first. <laughs> if, you can take that here. Claudette, come on, the word for Claudette. That's all right. You know you can do it. Shoot it right from the hip. Put your foot in there. Claudette. OK. Can't see it asked me to do this because I know another one about great sisters, Claudette Coleman, probably longer than anyone in here. Claudette Coleman was one of those great women who was a pioneer. We all know about Rosa Parks. Am I right around? Yes, sir. So how many of y'all really know about Claudette Coleman? This award was to go to her tonight, but she was not able to make it for health reasons. But the important thing is that Claudette Coleman stood up and challenged bus segregation in Montgomery, Alabama, several months before Rosa Parks did. Both of these were great women now, but one was charged with disorderly conduct, and uh, Claudette Coleman was charged with breaking the segregation law. Her case was the one that went to the Supreme Court her and several other women that ended, that, 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 that ended outlawed segregated travel and interstate travel on buses. So give her a hand in her absence. <laughs> Oftentimes in history, there are many great ones who made contributions, but they were lost in history. Somehow something happened. But there were many people, those of us from the South know that. Yes, sir. Most of the people who sacrificed their lives in the civil rights movement will never know their names. They were just ordinary working people like us in here. Yes, sir. We knew the leaders, but we don't know those thousands of people who belong to churches just like this, most of them. Yes, sir. College students, high school students. Claudette Coburn was a grade school student, I think a high school student when this happened and she took a stand and refused to give her seat up to a white passenger. 
like in so many cases. So give her another hand. This beautiful plaque is in her honor. People's Organization for Progress Women of the Month. Freedom Fighter Award presented to Claudette Coleman as an African-American woman history maker in the recognition of your contribution to the struggle for civil and human rights, for the emancipation of women and the liberation of our people. Power to the people. March 27, 2014. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Abelifo. Right in this sanctuary, Claudette Colvin said, when the man told her to get up and get her seat, she said she couldn't get up. She said Harriet Tubman was sitting on this shoulder, and so John the Truth was sitting on this shoulder, and she just would not and could not get up, because it was, in fact, Negro History Week. And she had the spirit of the ancestors and the sheroes driving her. Let me bring the chairperson of the North Branch of POP, Sister Joanne Sims, who's going to recognize my favorite council person, <laughs> Sister Mildred Crump. Good evening. I will be presenting to Mildred Crump the woman of many firsts. She is the first African-American cultural central, oh, excuse me. She is the first African-American councilwoman sworn July 1st, 1994. She is the first African-American female president of the North Municipal Council. July 1, 2006, she was sworn in as councilwoman at large. Born in Detroit, Michigan, she became the first African-American Braille teacher. In 1965, she moved to New Jersey. She became the first African-American Braille teacher in this state. She received her master's degree from Rutgers University, Newark, and public administration. She is the first African-American woman chosen by Garden State Women's Magazine to be named Garden State Women of the Year 2007. She is the, she is the founder of North Women Conference, Inc., an organization whose purpose is to, buy, to promote the empowerment of women in Newark. Um, the conference is a two-day event and has had more than 6,000 participants of all ages, social and ethnic backgrounds. She received a superhero by being selected as one of eight citizens from New Jersey to have her name inscribed on the Dr. Martin Luther King Monument located in Washington, D.C. November 2008, she was featured in O Magazine as one of 80 women selected nationwide out of 3,000 participants. Go girl. <laughs> she is the host of a local cable television show entitled Straight Talk with Mildred Crump. That's right. <laughs> also, she has a library in West Ghana named after her. Isn't that great? Ms. Crump retired in 2003 after 42 years as a Braille teacher and education consultant from New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visible Impaired. Ms. Crump is a widow and the proud mother of two children Lawrence Crump, an attorney in Newark, and Sherry Crump, an arts programmer in Georgia. I'm presenting this plaque to the Honorable President, Councilwoman at Large, Mildred Crump. <laughs>
Okay. A word. <laughs> Mildred. And the plaque says, I'm sorry. People's Organization for Progress, Women's History Month, Freedom Fighter Award presented to Mildred Crump, an African-American woman history maker, and in recognition of your contribution to the struggle for civil and human rights for the emancipation of women and liberation of our people. Power to the people. Power. Power. Thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. Thank you, Joanne. Power to the people. Power. All the time. All the time. Um, I stand before you, the granddaughter of slaves. My maternal grandparents were born into slavery in a little town called Cuthbert, Georgia, mm. near the railroad called Albany. Not Albany like we pronounce it up north, but Albany, Georgia. And I learned how to be a freedom fighter from my grandparents. And I accept this award in their honor. When I was asked to call out the names, I never failed to call my grandparents uh, name because it was the two of them that taught me what I should be about. And so in honor of George and Lula Johnson, uh, I accept this award. Pop is very dear to me. I am a, well, how many, 20, at least 25 year member. I pay my dues. I pay my dues. And if I don't, Joanne J Sims is knocking on my door saying it's time for you to pay your dues. Let me also do a little protocol and congratulate my fellow honorees on tonight. Um, and to certainly our special visitor, we welcome her to the city of Newark. What will we do without Larry Ham? I don't know about the rest of you. But the minute I heard, the minute I heard, the minute I heard that he was in an accident, I went on my knees and I said, God, we need him. So give him back to us and look at what God can do. <laughs> Thank you so much. This award means a great deal uh, to me. I was one of those fortunate, a little black girl that God took and gave extraordinary opportunities. And so because of those opportunities, I'd like to think that the Freedom Fighter Award is one that I have earned. God bless you. God keep you. Let us be inspired, all you young sisters out there, hard work and persistence. Clarity of vision. You too could be honored as a freedom fighter. Brother Carey, from Elizabeth Branch, POP. James Carey, give him a hand, please. Make a presentation to our beloved sister Theodora Lacey. Before I commence with the presentation, I want to say it's truly an honor to stand here in the absence of my dear brother, Cliff Arrington, and please let us keep his family in prayer during these trying times. Please indulge me as I read the bio of Theodore Smiley Lacey, civil rights leader, lecturer, and pioneer. Teenage resident Theodore Smiley Lacey has been deeply co committed to the struggle for equality for four decades. A native of Montgomery, Alabama, she grew up in the segregated South and encountered many forms of racism. Ms. Lacey, work, Ms. Lacey excuse me, worked closely with the, Rev, the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the famed bus boycott of 1955. In the summer of 1957, she joined her late husband, Dr. Archie Lacey, traveling throughout the counties of Alabama, researching voter registration and injustices in the political system of Alabama. This research served as a legal basis for the great wave of protests and litigation that sought to enf enfranchise the black voters in <coughs> Alabama. Mrs. Lacey's community involvement continued after the movement to Teaneck, New Jersey, where she played a major role in successfully integrating the public school system and is cited for her efforts in the book, Triumph in the White Suburb. 
by Reginald DeMero. She was chosen as delegate to Russia, representing New Jersey in a citizen to citizen exchange program. In addition, served on the Teaneck Township Ethics Board and presently serves as commissioner of Teaneck Township Historical Preservation Commission. Ms. Lacey chaired and coordinated Rosa Parks Day in Teaneck, New Jersey, the March for Peace and Freedom to Washington, D.C., and the Children's March on Washington. She is also a co-founder of the Teens Talk About Racism, an annual conference held at FDU for students throughout Bergen County. She serves as vice chair of the African American Advisory Board for Bergen County, chair of the Martin Luther King Birthday Observance Committee of Bergen County, and co-chair of the Martin Luther King uh, Committee, a project to erect a life-size statue of Dr. King in Hackensack, New Jersey. Ms. Lacey is the recipient of numerous awards include a Master Teacher Award from the uh, Teacher Training Institute, Teacher of the Year Award from TNEC, Outstanding Woman of New Jersey from the New Jersey uh, State Senate, and Most Outstanding Secondary teach, uh, School Teacher from Princeton University. In addition, she was honored by the Bergen Record as one of its most intriguing people and is the recipient of several awards from local diversity organizations, including the Sojourner Truth Award, the Negro Business and Professional Women of Bergen County, Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, Bergen County Urban League, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Community Service Award, Matthew Feldman Community Service Award, NAACP Service Award, and last but definitely not least, she was recognized with the Spirit of King Award from the Mount Calvary Baptist Church of Englewood. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to present Miss Lacey with the Freedom Fighter Award. And And its inscriptions read as follows, Freedom Fight Award presented to Ms. Theodore Lacey as an African-American woman history maker in recognition of your contribution to the struggle for civil and human rights, for the emancipation of women and the liberation of our people, power to the people. And I want to truly thank you because I truly stand on your shoulders. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. And, and thank you so much for that introduction. But you know, Martin Luther King taught me a long time ago that anybody can be great. That's right. That you don't have to have your verbs and subjects agree to be great. That you can be great because you can serve. That's right. And that all you need is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve. I must tell you that I was excited about coming. I'm always excited about coming here. This is uh, my second or third visit. I've been my third visit with you. But I must tell you a little story. What excited my heart so tonight was seeing Larry Hamm sing. Yeah. Yeah. We, go back, we go back a very, very long way. My daughter and Larry attended college together. And one day, I got a call from my daughter's roommate to tell me that not to worry if I did not hear from my daughter over the weekend, because she and Larry Ham and the hundreds of other Princeton students had taken over the Third World Center. Right. That, that was my introduction to Larry Ham. And I am so grateful and so fortunate that she had that experience and that I too have had an opportunity to, to witness and to be a part of the great work that he does. So thank you again for having me. Um, I'm, I'm in awe of being, to being able to stand here among these great people. You know, we all these great women. You know, we all have a story to tell. Our story begins even before we were born. My story began from crossing the Atlantic in the Middle Passage. It began from a grand, great grandmother who was sold as a slave from Bedford, Virginia to slaveholders in Alabama. Mm -hmm. So we can all trace our story back as to where we began. 
We didn't all do any things that we are doing today by ourselves. I'm so truly grateful to have grown up in Montgomery, Alabama with all of the negative, segregated system that I had to endure. But you know, I was taught in that segregated town of Montgomery that I could be anything I wanted to be. It was so unrealistic though, because when I walked out of my door, I couldn't be a bus driver, I couldn't sit in a seat that I wanted to on the bus, I couldn't be a clerk in a store. There were so many things that the outside world told me that I could do. But with strong parents and strong community leaders in my African-American neighborhood gave me the strength to step forward. As Melissa Harris says, the struggle continues, and so it does today. Please join me whenever you're in Bergen County. We hope to, by this summer, have erected the statue of Dr. Martin Luther King. Not for just for Dr. King. He would be the last person who would want a statue in his honor. But for those to learn about what it means to promote justice and peace and understanding among all people. I congratulate the People's Organization for trying to do just that, of carrying on the works of people like Dr. King to make a difference in the lives of all of us. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I don't know if y'all heard James Carey with his personal comment to Sister Lacey. But he stole my line, which I think is great minds thinking alike. And that is that we truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. And sometimes people think of giant as a male gender. These are giants. <laughs> this diminutive soul is a giant. Ask the white supremacists in North Carolina if that ain't a giant. And Brother Steve Hatch, who's our chairperson from Plainfield Branch, POP, has the honor to introduce and recognize Sister Willa Cofield. Thank you, brother. Well, first I'd like to say it's an honor that for you to ask me to do this because I met Dr. Cofield some 10 years ago um, when we started the Plainfield branch of the People's Organization for Progress. And I seen this little old lady come into my house. She came over there. I said, oh, okay, great. We're going to have a good meeting up here. You know, about 10 people came in there. And I will never forget, brothers and sisters, the, the love and the respect that I get from Dr. Cofield. See, I don't have a, obitu I mean, a, 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 a bio to read about Dr. Cofield. So I come and speak from my heart. Awesome. Just about how good she is and what she's done for me. Because through Dr. Cofield, I'm really five foot four, but I feel like I'm ten feet tall sometimes. Because sometimes it's the work that she does that she allows me to do. And you know how it is sometimes you're talking to person to people, but she always knows the right things to say to me to make me feel good about me, you know, about little old me, five foot four inches tall. But I feel like a giant sometimes. So. Dr. Cofield has done some amazing work since she's been here in the People's Organization for Progress. One time we were marching in Plainfield and we were marching on the streets and we didn't have a permit. A lot of the other women stayed back at the Quaker Meeting House. That's where we were gonna march to. They stayed there. But Dr. Cofield didn't do that. She came out there and marched with us. Even though we may have been arrested, even though they were threatening us that something could happen, but she was right there with us every step of the way. So I'd like to just read this to her. Uh, People's Organization for Progress Women's History Month Freedom Fighter Award presented to Willa Cofield, an African-American woman history maker, and, and, and in recognition of your contributions to the struggle for civil and human rights for the emancipation of women and the liberation of our people. Power to the People, March 27th, 2014. Thank you, Dr. 
It is a real honor to receive this plaque. It is a real honor to be recognized by people that you know, that people that you love, that people that you have such deep respect for. The People's Organization for Progress is the best run, the best organized right. group of freedom fighters right. that I've ever encountered. So I know that they know what a freedom fighter looks like. I have, as Steve didn't tell you my age, and maybe I won't tell you either. <laughs> But I, 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 think I'm, I think I'm the oldest member in the People's Organization for Progress. And there's one person who is a year younger than I, who is sitting over there, Jackie, I think. Jackie Duchesne. <laughs> Jackie Duchesne. But I, yes. I love the idea of being called a freedom fighter because it puts me in the class with people like Ella Baker. Yes. And Ella, Ella Baker was from the same county that I'm from, but I didn't know that until I was almost middle age. And when I found out that Ella Baker was, I reached out to her and I actually had a chance to meet her and to talk to her many, many times. So thank you for putting me in that category. I don't know whether many of you know that I used to work in women's history when I worked when I was in the Department of Education and I love women's history so I love having this particular program recognizing women. And I would like to accept this award that you're giving me in the name of two of the women who struggled in Enfield, North Carolina. Most of you have probably never heard of Enfield, North Carolina. It's a little town in northeastern North Carolina. It's where I lived and where we put up an intense battle against racism and segregation back in 1963 to 1965. And there were two women, particularly one who was my good close friend who died about four years ago. Her name was Lily Mason Smith. And Lily was our Rosa Parks. When we had protests in Enfield, we had a bench downtown that old white men sat on and smoked and no black people were permitted to sit on that bench. That was the way it was. When we had protests downtown, particularly with our young people, Lily, Lily Mason Smith would drape her arms over the back of this bench, cross her legs, and sit and look and say, I dare you put a hand on any one of our kids. The other person actually lives across, oh, somewhere near uh, West Kenny, uh, East Kenny, across Broad Street. Her name is Doris Daniels. And Doris was one of the young women in Enfield who in a demonstration was dragged two blocks by police, I mean literally in the street. She bears the scars on her knees to this day and thrown into jail. So I would like to remember those two young yes, women. Yes, the other women that I want to point to are the women of POP. Right. The women of the People's Organization for Progress, who are the backbone of this organization, right. who worked so hard. Yes. If you've ever been to our meetings and if you've heard the minutes read, or if you have heard the treasurer's report given, or if you have heard the corresponding secretary, if you have been to any of our protests and you see who's there, our women are so strong and so dedicated. So I want to 
recognize their contribution. The last group I want to accept this award in their name is just our black women who keep the world, keep the skies from falling. Where, where would we be? Where would we be if we did not have our women who get up every morning and fix the breakfast and get the kids ready for school, sometimes take them to the bus stop, sometimes take them to school, who go to work, maybe more than one job, who come home from work and cook dinner and see that the kids get their uh, homework done and put them to bed and maybe get a little break at the end of the day. And then they get up the next morning and they do it the same thing. The same thing. I have worked with a woman who says that that is the most important work that gets done. The work that ordinary women do to keep families going. Think about our raising the young, bearing the children, raising the young, taking care of the old, the sick and the dying. Our women deserve, they deserve more, we deserve more than a bar. It ought to be women's day year round. So, thank you again. Long live the spirit of resistance of Enfield, North Carolina. And the giants who led it. We had also chosen Sister Comrade Amina Baraka, the partner and comrade in struggle of our departed brother, Amiri Baraka, to be honored. And we will do tonight. But she was unable to be with us. And we will, in a future date, take care of that important work. We hope that you will join us and celebrating her contributions to our struggle. Now I have the honor to bring our chairman, your friend, our leader, Comrade Chairman Larry Hamm, to introduce our main speaker. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. If there ain't gonna be no justice, there ain't gonna be no peace. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I'm very glad. I thank God that I'm able to stand here with you tonight. Because Queen Mother Imaku, this could have been a different story. I have faced danger and I've faced death before. But this was the time, as I laid in the ambulance, I asked God, is this it? All right. yes, sir. But because of your love and your prayers and your support and modern medical science, <laughs> I'm able to stand here with you tonight. Yes, sir. And unless you think this is all drama, yes, when I went into University Hospital, yes, I had 17 broken ribs, yes, a broken arm, yes, a collapsed right lung, yes, a hematoma on my left lung, yes, a lacerated liver, and a punctured spleen. That was 
approximately 19 days ago, and 19 days later, I'm here with you tonight. hospital two days before the cards and the flowers and the staff in the hospital will say who are you I'm not making this up nurse walked in there who are you I'm just Larry I don't know who was there that day the visitors started coming the second day and they never stopped yes, until I left. Each morning the nurse would come in with a handful of get well cards. Yes, sir. One day, another white man walked in the room. I thought he was another white doctor. Yes, sir. He came over to me, said hello. I said hello. Yes, sir. Well, actually I said hello because I had two tubes <laughs> down my throat. He said, my name is Mr. Gonzalez. All right. I'm the president and CEO of University Hospital. He said, I want to make sure you're getting all the care that this hospital can give. And then I thought to myself, I said, it's good to be the chairman of the People's Organization for Congress. I don't want to call names. If I tried to name everybody that came to see me or sent me a card, I would end up offending somebody because somebody would get left out. I just want you to know that I love you too. I love you too with all my heart and with all my soul, with all my mind. And if I've been given they said the cat has nine lives. I guess I've been given a tenth. Yes, sir. I promise you that in this tenth life, I will work even harder than the first nine lives combined in the struggle for justice for our people. Yes, sir, Mr. There are so many to be recognized I want to recognize one whose name has not been called, and that's the Vice Chairwoman of the People's Organization for Progress, Mary Weaver. Why do I call on Mary Weaver? Not simply because she's the most outstanding Secretary General we've ever had, but Mary Weaver is the embodiment of the spirit of the People's Organization for Progress. When we met Mary Weaver in 1999, shortly after the death of Earl Faison, you know, that year, 99, was a banner year for police brutality. February 4th, 1999, Amadou Diallo was murdered. And then four months after that, here in Essex County in Orange, New Jersey, Earl Faison died in what the U.S. attorney said was a stairwell of torture. And then later on, a young man died at the hands of the East Orange Police. And that young man's name was Randy Weaver. Yes, sir. And his mother, Mary Weaver, came to our meeting. She didn't even ask for help the first time she came. She just came, sat quietly in the back of the room, 
and shortly thereafter joined the People's Organization for Progress. She didn't give, get up and make a big speech like many should and righteously so could have about the death of her son. What she did, she took her grief and she turned it into strength to make her an organizer for justice not only for her son, but for all the sons that have been victims of police brutality. And she has held a vigil every year since then in her son's name to keep alive her memory and to continue to work and organize for justice. She started out as a rank and file member, became assistant secretary, secretary general, that is statewide secretary of the central organization and of all branches. And just two years ago, she was elected vice chairwoman of the People's Organization for Progress. And she got more votes than I did as chair. So I thank you, Mary Weaver. I also want to thank Susan Newton, who was the committee chair for this program tonight. Give her a big hand, Susan Newton. And I see some other guests. Please forgive me if I don't recognize everybody. I am a disciplined member of the People's Organization for Progress, and I know my time here is limited. But I would be less than the freedom fighter I purport to be. If I, if I did not recognize this other great freedom fighter that's with, here to, that's with us here tonight, who has been campaigning for the freedom of our, one of our greatest political prisoners, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Sister Pam Africa. Sister Pam Africa is here tonight. Give Sister Pam Africa. Give her a big hand. Sister Pam And believe me, if I'd have known we, you were coming, you'd have been the sixth awardee tonight. We stand as Brother Carrie, the chairman of the Elizabeth Branch said, on the shoulders of these giants. Claudette Colvin, whose case along with that, with her co-defendants, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and Aurelia Browder. It was their case that went to federal district court and then to the US Supreme Court. Their case that was argued by Thurgood Marshall and others. It was the case of Claudette Colvin that declared segregated seating on buses and trains unconstitutional. She is a giant. Theodore Lacey, when, whenever we talk about the most effective action that we have ever engaged in on the list of the top five, always is the Montgomery bus boycott. Let me make it plain. We asked Sister Theodora Lacey to be here tonight because she was a steering committee member of the Montgomery bus boycott, the greatest boycott in the history of this country. We're in the room with giants, freedom fighters, you don't have to look abroad. You don't have to look at Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We got freedom fighters right here in our midst today. Yes, sir. 
Willa Cofield, so humble, would not tell you how she stood against the Ku Klux Klan in Enfield, North Carolina. How she stood against the white supremacists and the racists who fought tooth and nail to keep in place the system of racial apartheid that existed here in America. Yes, and I was so lucky to come to meet Willa Cofield. And we are so lucky that she joined the People's Organization for Progress, but she didn't even tell her story, how she lost her job, and her husband lost her job, and how they had to leave North Carolina, like Claudette Colvin had to leave Alabama, and Rosa Parks had to leave Alabama. She sacrificed. We are able to stand here liberated from legal apartheid because of Willa Cofield and women like Willa Cofield. I was listening to a program I like. Maybe you listen to it too. A program called Democracy Now. Yes. And I was listening last year, it was in the summertime. Yes, I don't know what the occasion was, but the guest at that time was a lady named Sarah Collins Rudolph. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> who is Sarah Collins Rudolph? And then I thought for a minute about the name Collins. Yes, sir. Where had I heard that name before? Yes, sir. Back in 1987, when I was working for the Commission for Racial Justice of the United Church of Christ, as director of the National Community Organization Program under the leadership of the Reverend Ben Chavis. Yes, sir. In 1987, we went on a symbolic freedom ride to visit all the places, the points of challenge where black people confronted the racists and the terrorists. We hear a lot about terrorists. Black people in America know more about terrorism than any talk show pundits. We've been the victim of racial terror in this country. And one of the places that we visited in 1987, and what they called the Black Belt of Alabama, was a church called the 16th Street Baptist Church. And we went into that church and we were given a tour and the tour guide was the father of Deborah McNair. Deborah McNair was one of the four girls that died when that church was bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, sir. Why did they bomb that church? Because that church, like Abyssinian Baptist Church, was not just a place for symbolic ritual and symbolic worship. Yes, sir. It in fact was a citadel for spiritual renewal, but it was also the center for community organizing against racism in Birmingham, Alabama. Yes, sir. And I learned as I looked at the plaque that was on the wall that one of those four girls that was killed was Addie Mae Collins. And I thought, Sarah Collins, Addie Mae Collins. And then Amy Goodman went on to say that Sarah Collins Rudolph was the sister of Addie Mae Collins. And I said the same thing then that I said when I had heard Claudette Cole. I said, we got to bring Sarah Collins Rudolph to Newark, New Jersey. So our people could see real living history. So we've flown her up here tonight. 
her and her husband. And before I introduce her, I'd like her husband, George, to come up and give us greetings from the people of Birmingham, Alabama. Damn, when you said it, it got to me the way you said those things about my wife. It touched me, you know, what you said. You hit it right on the nail. But uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank y'all. Thank this great organization for allowing us to be here. My wife, Sarah, me, I really appreciate y'all, sir. It really touched me. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I love y'all. I'm a member. I'm a member. I told Ms. Antoinette I got to be a part of this. <laughs> Me and my wife. We want to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And now, brothers and sisters, on September 15, 1963, the 16th Baptist Church, 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. Yes, sir. Time-wise, this is significant because just two weeks before was the Great March on Washington yes, sir. for jobs and freedom. It was in 1963 at that march where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Yes, sir. And some say that the church was bombed in retaliation for the March on Washington yes, sir. in 1963. Yes, sir. We know about Spike Lee's movie, Four Little Girls, and many of us know the names of the four girls that were killed at that time, but many people don't know 22 other children were injured. Yes, sir. Four were killed, 22 were injured, including Addie Mae Collins' sister, Sarah, who lost an eye in the explosion and was partially blinded in the eye that was saved. There was such an outcry about the bombing that it created an atmosphere of sympathy in the nation and in the Congress. Yes, sir. And within about nine months from the bombing, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. Yes, sir. Sitting among us tonight is a woman who made possible the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And many of us, because of that act, are able to live in places that we were barred from, able to work in places that we were barred from, able to go to school in institutions that would not take black people and people of color. And today, that law becomes the weapon with which Many continue to fight yes, sir. racial discrimination. And as is so often the case, yes, those who make change do not themselves become the beneficiaries of that change. This woman could not even get money to pay her medical bill. And I thought, how many black people have entered the middle class, have corporate jobs? How many black people have gone into government and have high paying government jobs because of the Civil Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement and because of Sarah Collins? How many? There's no reason why she should be begging to pay her medical bills 
when she's done so much for our people in this country. I bring you Sarah Collins Rudolph. church. People have gone around the world talking about what happened that day. But you know, they don't know, know what happened like I know it. Because I was there. You know, I was there that morning. So you're going to hear the real story from me today. So I just thank everybody here that came to hear the real story. You know, uh, that morning, it was just like every other morning. It was nice and warm. And Addie, my other sister, Janie, we walked to church that morning. And while we was walking to church that morning, we were having such a good time. My sister Janie had this little purse. And we were just throwing it and catching it and just running and catching it and throwing it back not even knowing what we were finna walk into that morning. But anyway, when we got there, my sister Janie, she came to the, to the lounge and we, to freshen up. And when she left out, she said, Sarah, you had to make sure you go to your class. And she went on upstairs where her class was. She, her class was upstairs with the seniors. And since our class was in the basement, we were the junior classes. So when she went, Ed and I decided we weren't going to our class because we didn't like our teacher and she was so mean to us. So we stayed downstairs. We had really shot her at that morning. So as I looked out the door waiting for my class to turn out, and that's when I, I noticed Denise McNeil, Cynthia Wesley, and Carol Robson, they was coming toward the lounge. So I went on back in and I stood by the sink, you know, just acting like I was just in there washing my hands. So Addie, she stood by the window, she didn't move. But when the three girls came in, they went on the other side where the uh, stalls was. And when they came out, Denise Magnell stood in front of Addie and asked her to tie the sash on her dress. And while I was looking toward her to tie the sash, we all stood there waiting, but we never did see a tie. That's when a bomb went off, boom. And all I could say was Jesus, because it was such a loud sound, and it just scared me, just shook me up. And then I began to call Addie, because I, I couldn't see. I didn't know what had happened, because the debris was in my eyes, you know, glass. And I said, Addie, Addie, Addie. And she didn't say anything, so by me, by, I couldn't see anything. I thought maybe they had went over where the classroom ran and there where the classroom was. So uh, all of a sudden I heard this sound. Somebody said, somebody bombed the 16th Street Church. And the voice was so uh, clear to me, it was as though this person was right there. But what had happened, it blew a hole right into the side window where they were standing. And when it blew that hole in the, in the church, 
this man came straight through the hole and he got me out. He just picked me up and his arm and carried me out and put it put me in the ambulance. And uh they rushed me on over to uh Hilma Hospital. It was Hilma at that time, but they changed it now to university. And they put me on the cot because they said the eye doctor wasn't there. So while I was on the land there on the cot, Janie came in and I asked her what was Addie. And she said that Addie had hurt her back. I guess she said that because she didn't want me to get upset. So I didn't say anything. And she said that Addie will be here to see me tomorrow. So they rushed me on upstairs to operate on my eyes. I had had so many pieces of glasses about, the doctor had said that, that I had about 22 pieces of glasses in, in my eye, and it was, uh, and that included my face also. But anyway, when they got through operating on me, I went on upstairs to my room, and that's when uh, my mother began to tell me that uh, Addie, that all the girls was killed. And uh, I didn't see anything, but I just couldn't sleep. And I was just wondering, why did they kill Ed and those, you know, the other girls? I said, God, you know, they didn't do anything, you know, be killed like that. But, you know, I was 12, I really didn't understand, you know, what was really going on. But anyway, I stayed there in the hospital about, i say about a month or so. And when, I, when they uh, began to take the bandage off my eye, the doctor asked me, what do I see out of my left eye? I said, I see a little light. And then he asked me, what do I see out of my right eye? So I told him, I can't see anything. So I was uh, totally blind at my right eye after the bombing. So I remember, I didn't get a chance to even go to the girls' funeral. And when I was released from the hospital, you know, during that time, they didn't they didn't give you any kind of counseling. So I just had to go back to school in that bad condition. You know, I was had I was nervous. I had a lot of fear in me. And uh I would hear that sound, just to hear that loud sound. Boom. It was such a loud sound. I was surprised that I didn't lose my hearing. It was just something like a I imagine something like an atomic bomb. I don't know how many sticks of dynamite they put under that church, but it was a very, very loud noise. So anyway, I was released, and I just had to go to the uh, back to school. I stayed home at least about a week, and I had to go right back to school without any counseling. People, people looked like they just weren't concerned, and people didn't talk about that bombing much. It was just a quiet thing. I, I don't know why it was so quiet, but I know. It made a lot of people leave Birmingham, Alabama. You know, a lot of my uh, uh, friends in school, they left going up north. But we stayed, we stayed in Birmingham. And our church was, was service was at the LR Hall until it was rebuilt. And about a year or so, they, we went back. And I think being there, I, I was there at least about a week or two because I know my mother, she seen how I was reacting. I was still fearful and nervous. So she decided to leave 16th Street Baptist Church. And I was so glad because I didn't want to be in there anymore in, in that condition. I wasn't comfortable in there. And I would sit, sit in there like a zombie because I was just a, so fearful, you know, just thinking another bomb would go off in that church. But anyway, I went on back to school in that condition. But before, my uh, doctor had told my mother to bring me back that February because they was gonna have to remove my right eye. Mm -hmm. Because if they didn't remove my right eye, I would go blind in my left eye. Mm -hmm. So I stayed out of school during that process, maybe about a week. And then I had to come back to school in, in, in such a bad condition till I really didn't want to be there. And I, my grades had dropped. And I was so glad that it was almost time to go to this high school, Parker High School, because 
I figure the people at Parker High School wouldn't know that I was in a bombing. But I asked my husband later, he graduated with me, and I asked him, did they know that I was in a bombing? He said, yes. He said, everybody knew it at high school. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, they didn't treat me any different. You know, you know, some kids would probably say a few words, or say, you know. But I didn't feel like they were, but after I, you know, asked him and I, I found out I, I was, uh, I was, uh, you know, really glad to leave. The children asked me, uh, did, was I going to college? And I told them, no. I said, I ain't going to college. I said, it's just a blessing to get, a, get away from, graduate from high school. And I wasn't in, really in a fit, fix to go. But I stayed uh, uh, busy. After high school, I got a job working in plants because I was so disfigured. My faith was so disfigured. So I just really didn't want to be around people in my condition. So I got a job working at two plants. And afterwards, I just, you know, I had left my mother, so I know I had to work to, you know, to, get, to get me a place to stay. So I got me a place to stay, and I was still in that bad condition, really just still nervous and, and fearful. And just, uh, I went and got me a house, and also uh, I began to drink. Some uh, one of my boyfriend introduced me to alcohol, drugs, and I did that thinking that that was really going to help my condition. Doing all this, but it did. Got some, got in bad relationship, thinking I would, they would make me happy, but that didn't. That didn't make me any happier. So anyway, uh, I remember my sister Jane. She she came up to me and she said that, you know, Sarah, you need to, you need to go to this church that I'm going to now. Uh, God is just really using this apostle to work miracles. So I asked her. I said, where is it located? And she told me it was on Avenue G, but I thought she said Avenue C. So I went looking for it on Avenue C. And I didn't find it. And I know the devil was glad. But anyway, I asked her, I asked her that, uh, I was look, I said, I, look, I was looking for the church, but I didn't find it. And she said, where do you go? I said, I went on Avenue C. She said, I didn't say that. I said, Avenue G. And I asked her, I said, are you going tonight? She said, yes. So I said, I would go. That night, well, I said, I told her, I said, well, I'd be coming over to your house to make sure I go to your church, which, you know, the church she was talking about. So we met up, and we got there. And when I got into the church, the apostle was preaching about being saved and being sanctified and repent, uh, repent all your sins and just leave it to God, because God will put it in the water, and he won't remember your sins anymore. So I said, that sounds good, because I know I had did a lot of sin during that time. <laughs> so anyway, he pointed to the doors. He said, if anybody want to get baptized, he said, ladies, you go to your right, and the man, you go to your left. So I was, so I said, well, I think I'd do that then. So I ran that way so fast, I left my shoes at my seat. I was really ready to uh, repent. He said, he said, told me, the people, he said, well, God will uh, forgive you. And he said, the saints are up there to pray you through. So I went on up, and one of the saints came to me and said, just ask God to forgive you, and you're sorry, and you won't do it again. So I got on my knees and I began to say, Lord Jesus, I said, to save me. And I told my I told him to save me. And uh, after a while I walked on out and he put me under water and I went on down in the water, got baptized. And when I got out the water, I felt pretty good, but I still had this nervous condition and uh, had fear. So he asked if anybody want to, uh, joined the church that night. And I 
said, yeah, I went on up there. And, Cause I, me, my sister Jane and I, we like to be together anyway. So I went on and joined that night. And while I was there, I would just sit there like a zombie. I just couldn't move. I just sit still. And I wanted to do what the other people was doing. Getting up, you know, testifying and, and get on the usher board. Just really do all this, you know. But when I seen them doing these things, I said, oh, I said, how do they get up like that? I said, they really are bold, you know, getting up, to, talking to God and testifying and just singing and all this. And I just wanted to do this, this too. So then I was just sitting there real close to the front of the church. And he looked at me and he said, you. He pointed his finger at me. He said, you, come here. So I went on up there and, and uh, he said, raise your hand up like this. And I raised my hand up. And he began to pray. He said, you know what? God showed me that you have a nervous condition. And also, you suffer from fear. And I said, just like that. And he said, T tonight is your night. God is going to heal you tonight. So I went on that day, and he began to pray and lay his hand on my head like that. And, talking to God, and I hit the flow. You know, you've probably seen those people hit the flow. <laughs> so I hit the flow. And, and when I got back up, I was so amazed. I, when, when he prayed, I thought, I got on the Ursha board, <laughs> and I went up there and I was the devotion leader. And also, I went up there to sing a song one day, and I, I couldn't even carry a tune, but I went up there, I went up there and I sang that song. And God really healed me. He healed me up. He even healed me of my a disfigured face. He didn't do it that night. I was at one of his tent meetings. And he told me to come up there. He said, you know what, your face is disfigured, but God is gonna show me, God is gonna, heal you tonight. Because my face wasn't nothing like it is now. It was full of, like I said, my face was, I had about 22 pieces of glass in my face. Thank you. Thank you. He said, God is going to heal you tonight. And he healed my face. And I just thank God. And, uh, I remember I went on to his tent meeting. He was held held tent meeting at a certain place in Greymouth. He told me all about myself. I didn't nobody know this, but God had shown him this. Mm -hmm. He looked at me. He said, "Come here." And I went on up there. He said, "I see smoke all around you." Mm -hmm. He said, "Do you know what I'm singing?" And I said, "He said God showed me that you're supposed to be dead." Oh. But you know what? A beam is supposed to fell on you. But God sent his angel to catch it. And I know that had to be God because I never did tell anybody about my background. And I know didn't nobody tell them. And that day, I know when I call on God, God spared my life because I wouldn't be here today. Sing that church, the cars around it. That day, you know, during that time we had steel cars. You know, it's not what we have now. The cars was towed. Every car that was uh, located where that barn was located, they was towed. Them. But God, He spared my life, and I know today, God spared my life to let the people know yes. that he is real. Okay. So, so I, always, I always leave this to everybody. I've been traveling all around the world telling my testimony, so I leave this with you all. If you tried everything and everything failed, Jesus. Yeah. 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 I just want to say this. Uh, I know.
of my hood was still telling everybody about, he told me to tell the people about my sister remained uh, missing. So uh, we wanted to move my sister to a new, new uh, into a mausoleum. But when we went to, to exhume her body, her remains, she wasn't in it. It was someone that had dentures, and my sister didn't have any dentures. So please pray that we will locate her because we're still thinking about moving her into a mausoleum. Thank you. to take up a collection as you can imagine we've had um, many expenses related to producing this program tonight so I hope that uh, you will give generously I saw Steve with the basket let's get it moving <laughs> everybody start the book what about checks right we will take checks make checks payable to people's organization for progress we take food stamps. no I'm just joking <laughs> While, while we are taking up the collection, uh, Ingrid Hill and Ann Janetta Robinson are going to come forward and make a presentation to Ms. Rudolph, Ms. Collins Rudolph. Ingrid Hill, our state correspondent secretary, Ann Janetta Robinson, our treasurer. No words can express the appreciation that we have for Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph. Um, but we're going to give you a plaque. Um, the People's Organization for Progress Women's History Month presents the Freedom Fighter Award presented to Sarah Collins Rudolph, survivor of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 in honor of your contribution to the Civil Rights Movement and passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in recognition of you, your sister, fallen companions, and your living testimony and resistance to racist terror, we salute you for your strength, courage, commitment, and being a beacon of hope for a better world. Power to the people, March 27, 2014. Sister Sarah, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody that gave me this beautiful plaque. Thank you so very much. I just love everyone, and I hope that God will bless all of you. And I would love to see you again, and I love the city. And thank you, and God bless you. Thank you so much. As we normally do, thank you, Sister Collins. Thank you. We have a resolution of respect for Sarah Collins Rudolph. We, the members of the People's Organization for Progress, present this resolution of respect and appreciation for our champion in the struggle for civil and human rights, Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph. Whereas on that tragic day, September, Sunday, 15, 1963, about two weeks after the historic march on Washington, when the Ku Klux Klan bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and whereas Sister Sarah, only 12 years old at the time, was gravely wounded from this vicious and sinister act of terror and was instantly blinded in both eyes when she tried to rescue her sister, Addie Mae Collins. And whereas on that day, those four little girls, Denise McNair, only 11 years old, Cynthia Wesley Morris, Carol Robertson, and Sarah's sister, Addie Mae Collins, each of them only 14 years old, were all killed in that sinister bombing. And whereas sister Sarah and 21 other children were also injured in the blast. 
And whereas the law enforcement apparatus of Birmingham and the state of Alabama were complicit and slow to investigate and prosecute that vicious act of terror as a consequence of owning several centuries of the most violent racial prejudice, and whereas the principal suspect, Robert Chambliss, who was seen planning the deadly device and found later to have had 122 sticks of dynamite in his possession, when investigated by authorities, was let go and merely fined for the possession of the dynamite. And whereas Chambliss was not subjected to a meaningful prosecution until 1977 and his cohorts until 2000, whereas Sister Sarah to this day has not received any compensatory damages from the state of Alabama and is forced to continue to work even though she has lived with impaired vision as a consequence of that act of terror. And whereas the quest for those compensatory damages are now the subject of a nationwide petition drive that we all should support, see, sign, and share on petition.org. Whereas the People's Organization for Progress, along with other forces of goodwill, will continue to support all efforts to secure those proper compensatory damages for Sister Sarah in the interest of justice. And whereas the fallout from that bombing and continued protest activity helped usher in the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and whereas the fallout from that sinister act of terror and continued protest also helped usher in the local desegregation of public facilities in Birmingham proper. And whereas following years of pain silence, Sister Sarah traveled nationwide, recounting her powerful account of tragedy and survival for all those who would hear. Whereas all this clearly establishes that Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph is a critically important pioneering freedom fighter in our struggle for civil and human rights. Whereas Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph's story and example demonstrates the historical fortitude of African American women and the struggle for racial, social, and economic justice. Therefore, be it resolved, the People's Organization Organization for Progress officially recognizes and honors the commitment and stand that Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph has taken and continued to take for freedom, justice, equality, and peace. Respectfully submitted this Thursday, March 27, 2014, by the officers and members of the People's Organization for Progress, be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution of respect be given to Sister Sarah Collins Rudolph and a copy placed in the organization's archive. Long live the spirit of Sarah Collins Rudolph. Long live the spirit of Sarah Never forget four little girls. 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 And always remember the fifth. In the spirit of youthful resistance, I'd like to bring our chairperson, Sandra Haywood, and the representatives of the popcorn kids would like to make a, make a presentation to Sister Collins Rudolph. Sandra, tell everybody who popcorn kids are. The popcorn kids, their name is for a people organization for progress, children of right now. I started this organization of youth in 2010, and it was to give youth children a platform to speak on issues that was going on in their lives where they may feel that adults was not listening to them. So for 15 months, uh, we are the only 
organization that have a youth program that does black history programs every month at the Irvington Library. Uh, during, this, uh, during this celebration of them learning of black history, they also celebrate Kwanzaa every month because I had to let them understand that. You need to practice the principles of Kwanzaa all your life, you know. You know, I had to teach you to respect others, yourself and your community. Yes, so in order to give, so I have two representatives of the Popcorn Kids, our youth and her mentor, to present her with an appreciation award and the award from the city of Irvington for Mayor Wayne Smith. Take your time, sister. I stand here tonight as a youth of Pop's program. The Popcorn Kids and I would like to pass the baton to my mentor, Jalisa, to honor Miss Sarah Rudolph. Mrs. Rudolph, on behalf of the Popcorn Kids of Irvington, New Jersey, we would like to thank you for your courage and you show us, as well as children all around the world, that you should never give up on anything that you believe in, no matter your circumstance. You show us that even though our walk might be rough throughout the 365 days in the year, we will still overcome whatever it is that we go through. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you on behalf of the Popcorn Kids. And also I want to present you with an award from our mayor in Irvington, it's a certificate of recognition um, presented to Ms. Sarah Collins Rudolph, the sole survivor. In honor of your bravery during such a horrific experience on September 15, 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church, Birmingham, Alabama, the Township of Irvington salutes you during Women's History Month and beyond, presented on this 27th day of March 2014. Thank you. Ms. Mildred. What an honor it is for me to present to this courageous, outstanding uh, freedom fighter. Um, I'm a great believer that one should give flowers to one while they can still smell them. That means kind words, while they're still vertical and not horizontal, while you can be seen and not viewed. And so on tonight, we celebrate your life. Uh, we celebrate your struggle. I shall not read the words uh, that are written here, but they simply chronicle your journey. Um, I'm one of inspiration uh, to those of us who have been fortunate enough to be in your space and in your atmosphere. The good news is that we're presenting this on today, but the better news is that 100 years from now, when they're looking through archives, they will find your name. <laughs> History has been written. Generations yet unborn will know that you want this great city called Newark. God bless you and God keep you. The mayor has also Sent, mm -hmm. We're going to be new best friends. Y'all know that. Uh, should I read them? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I shall read um, the, rec the proclamation, sorry, from uh, the mayor. As mayor of the city of Newark, it is my pleasure. I'm going to ask all Newarkers, would you please stand? If, if you live in Newark, stand with me. Stand with me. Now. If you love Newark, stand with me. <laughs> As mayor of the city of Newark, it is my pleasure to send my best wishes to everyone attending the recognition ceremonies for Sarah Collins Rudolph. Often called the fifth girl in quotes, Mrs. Rudolph is the sister of Addie Mae Collins, who along with her three friends, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, perished when a white racist 
planted a bomb at the 16th Street Baptist Church more than 50 years ago in Birmingham, Alabama, seeking to terrorize the civil rights movement. The bombing instead outraged a nation and inspired the movement to continue the fight, combined with the resilience and courage de demonstrated by Sarah Collins Rudolph the result, result, sorry, was a civil rights dialogue that led to major civil rights legislation being enacted by the United States Congress. We are grateful to you, Sarah, for sharing your story and imparting your wisdom with generations of young and old alike in this country and this world. Your legacy of activism continues to encourage many like me to live and work with integrity, pride, courage, and faith. It is a privilege to honor a woman whose wisdom and contributions continue to have great influence and impact in our community and our world. You have touched the lives of many people, inspiring them to build upon your work. And so on this special day, the people of Newark salute and thank you for the many contributions you have made to our nation and humanity and send you our best wishes for now and your future. Sincerely, Louis A. Quintana, Mayor of the Great City of New York. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Excuse me. Oh, yes. <laughs> I would like to present to you the, proclam the proclamation for appreciation. Miss Sarah Collins Ruloff, on this occasion of celebrating Women's, Women's Month on this 27th day of March, 2014, as we celebrate our black women of history, we the members of the Popcorn Kids and the People's, of Organ the People's Organization for Progress, we proclaim to the world how proud we are for your courage, your steadfast res resilience to be the best that only you can be. You are our past and our legacy and our lives are entwined in your accomplishments. Power to the people and the children. I believe, stay right here. I believe there are other resolutions, community resolutions, NAACP of Orange and Maplewood. Brother. Good evening. I'm Eddie Young from the Oranges and Maplewood NAACP. I have another member here, Cynthia Murray. Hi, we bring a resolution to Sarah and Collins Randolph. Rudolph. I'm sorry, Rudolph. Got to get to my president about this. Okay. <laughs> Whereas on September the 15th, 1963, you were attending the 16th Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Whereas Denise McNair, Cal Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, and Addie Mae Collins also were present on the morning of September the 15th. Whereas without cause, a bomb was detonated and caused the death of Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, and Addie Mae Collins. Whereas, as a result of the malicious attack on the 16th Avenue Baptist Church, you were seriously injured and hospitalized for many weeks. Whereas, the cowardly act was designed to instill fear in you. Whereas, your survival of the attack on the 16th Avenue Baptist Church symbolizes your strength and fortitude to overcome trauma and stress. Whereas you have been endured physical, mental, and emotional trauma from the bombing, your spirit remains strong. Therefore, be it resolved that the Oranges and Maplewood unit of the NAACP gives honor to your survival as testimony to God's goodness. Be it resolved that the Oranges and Maplewood unit of the NAACP 
support your endeavors to receive financial compensation for the horrific act of terrorism that you endured. Thomas L. Puryear, President, Harry Reid, Secretary. And if I, if I might like to uh, say one, we'd like to say thank you to our Vice President, Mary Weaver, who is also the President of the NAACP, CP of the Oranges in Maplewood. Uh, bless her, she is just an amazing person. And I'd like to say to um, you and your family, Ms. Sarah Collins Rudolph, that a brief look at your bio, it said that you were touring the country um, sharing your tale of survival. But it should also read that you're sharing a tale of living history, you're a living legend, strength, heroism, and reaching back for a sibling, because we have, all of those of us who have siblings, we know you don't feel complete if you're somewhere and something happens and you don't find your brother or your sister. So you're living history, you are now civil rights royalty, rightfully so, we need to recognize you, and as you share your story, I hope that it can reach through the souls of some of our young people that we are losing so badly who don't know what a real struggle is. They think a struggle is a beef with the person next to them. They don't know, they don't know what survival is. They don't know what persistence is. They don't know what living spirit is. And I hope they experience you somehow, some way. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. I love you too. And from the New Brunswick branch of the nation's oldest civil rights organization. What's your name, brother? Bruce Morgan. Bruce Morgan, from New Brunswick, NAACP. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ms. Collins, give me one minute, please. I want Larry Ham. I want to thank you very much for allowing us this opportunity. Yes, sir. I want to thank the Lord for sparing you. Yes, sir. And I want to wish you a swift, smooth, speedy recovery. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is just a little few words from the New Brunswick Area Branch, NAACP. Ms. Sarah Collins Rudolph, we are honored and humbled to be in your presence. Through no choice of your own, but by his hand, you were thrust into the forefront of the fight for civil rights on a Sunday morning in 1963. Your bloody, broken, and battered body has become a living memorial to the sacrifice of your sister, Addie Mae Collins, and playmate Cynthia Wesley, Cal Robinson, and Denise McNair. The New Brunswick Area Branch, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, wishes to take this occasion to thank you for your steadfast community to remembering the world of, to, to reminding the world of hatred and bigotry that led to this horrible event. Yes, sir. We also want you to know that we appreciate your lifelong fight to bringing peace, justice, and equality to our nation and the world at large. It is our privilege to stand before you and this audience and say thank you for all you have done. And we stand on your shoulders as we carry on the legacy you have laid before us. Yes. We pray he keeps you in his hands in unity. Bruce S. Morgan, President, Deborah L. Morgan, Secretary, and the New Brunswick Area Branch, NAACP. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And from another trend of the United Front for Freedom, I bring our comrade Zaid Muhammad, Minister of Information for New Black Panther Party. It's hard to come behind so much that has been said and done tonight. But out of honor and respect, let me just say a couple things. Some of the baddest black women I know on this earth are right in this organization. That's number one. It's all the work and struggle, a lot of that went on right in my home. And you should see, you should see them scrapping with each other how to get this right. And they got it right, so give them a strong black hand. My comrades, my sisters from the People's Organization of Progress. Sister, Sister Sandra for neglected to mention that the groundbreaking work that she has done with the popcorn kids, sharing black history every single month, happens, happens every fourth Saturday 
including March 29th, the next Saturday. So anyone with school-aged children, you ain't got nothing to do with them, we got an answer to that question for you. Bring them to the Irvington Public Library at 1 o'clock and we'll do something with them that they'll never forget. Right? Sandra Hayward, give her a strong black hand. And before I get to our beloved special guests, both of us in here shedding tears, we're not known for shedding tears. But that's how much we love you. And let me tell you something else. close. It was real close. A revolutionary could not do what we do without being governed by strong feelings of love, said Che Guevara. And it's the love that this man has for you that gave him the strength to fight back from where he was. He was on the brink. Almost out of here. Walked three miles today. Walked two yesterday. Where's Jeffrey Dye? Where's Anjanetta Robinson? He, he took them. He made sure that he, they made sure that uh, he outwalked Angie. <laughs> right? But that's the love of our people. You can't make this up. And, and, and it's not enough of it going around in the form of leadership that you still vote for and get, it sells you out all the time. He don't sell you out. Why are we not making more Larry Hams? Why are we not making more Demos? Why are we not upholding the model that he has given us for so many years? That's a mistake that we have to correct right now. Now, I have good news and I have bad news. Uh -oh. Sister Sarah, the survivor of Klan terror. Klan been here since 1866. You would think of the government as big as bad in the United States, that that kind of terror would be banned. I have bad news for you. The Klan is still active. Huh? We are here today not just to honor what has gone on in the past in resistance and struggle, but to carry on that struggle. And I'm here to tell you that your new Black Panther parties in Jasper, Texas, and will be on, on April 7th, locked and loaded, to confront the Klan over the lynching of Alfred Wright. Young black man, a good son in this community, just made the mistake of being involved with a, a person of European descent. And they made him disappear. And when they found him, let me tell you something about how this Klan does. They found him with his eyes cut out. They found him with his ear cut off. They found him with his throat cut. And then they just took the, sh the shiniest dime they could find and planted it right there and said, yeah, we did it. And I'm going to tell you something else. You got to speak up and speak to and make these primetime black leaders do what they're supposed to do. Right. It was our struggle that, that made a justice department Finally bring the bad to justice, the vicious racists that did what they did to her family and to her friends. But this Justice Department, black led, president and attorney general alike, are trying to tread softly out of fear of offending white folks. That is not what we fought for. That is not what we fought for. If you're going to be on the job, you're going to do it. And if it's ugly, clean it up and make it right. That's what this struggle is. And if you got a problem doing it, then guess what? We're going to train our people to fight their real enemies and we'll clean it up ourselves. We'll clean it up ourselves. So, sister, we carry on standing squarely on your shoulders. Standing squarely on your shoulders, Mother Mildred. Standing squarely on your shoulders, Madam Theodore. 
I want you to know that my daughter is a great, great niece of Ella Baker. We just found that out. Oh, so it's, it's the gen whole new generation coming, Miss, Miss Cofield. And let me bring this daughter up. That's right. Now, y'all heard about the petition? This is little sister Victoria. All right. She's not going to just present these flowers as, because see, we don't, we don't get these while we live it. I'm glad he got those, but it took an accident. It almost took his life to get those. He's been doing this over 40 years. Right. Ma'am, you're going to get your flowers while you can yeah. smell them. Right. And I'm going to let this young new leader, I'm going to sit down and let this young new leader tell you about how, how important that petition drive that she helped start. Go ahead, tell right. me, daughter. Um, praise the Lord, church. Uh, excuse the way I'm dressed, I just came right from school, so. Um, I recently, I, I'm ashamed to say that I recently just found out about Miss Rudolph. And I just, I've always known about the four little girls and the bombing, but I never knew that there was a fifth victim and a fifth little girl. And when my mom found out, she told me about it, because she always tells me everything that is historically involved, she told me about it. And I sat down and I was truly ashamed that I didn't know, and I felt like I had to do something about it. So my mom and I, we sat down and we got in contact with Miss Sarah and her husband um, on, through Facebook, and so, <laughs> and we sat down and we said we wanted to start a petition because after 50 years, she never received financial restitution for all of her injuries. And it is time, it is beyond time that she gets what she deserves, and she deserves even more, but this is the least that we can do. Right. So my mom and I sat down and we said we wanted to start a petition. We found a lady, uh, her name is Reverend Tony DePina, and she had already started a petition on change.org. So my mom and I teamed up with Reverend Tony DePina, and we have started a petition online for Smith's uh, Rudolph and it's on change.org and you can find it on there. We are asking for financial restitution because you truly deserve it. Absolutely. You truly deserve it. And so, and it is sad that we only have two, a little over 2,000 signatures for a woman who has done so much to change history. And it is sad that we only have 2,000 signatures? That's sick. For a woman who has done so much. Come on, come on. I I couldn't I wouldn't be able to stand here right now if it wasn't for Miss Rudolph. That's right. I wouldn't be able to go to the school that I go to if it wasn't for Miss Rudolph. So I want to present these to you and I ask everyone to please sign the petition. It's online on change.org. There are a lot of different petitions for her, but this one we're really trying to push. Um, it's on change.org, and you can put in Reverend Tony DePina's petition for Sarah Collins Rudolph. And we ask, please spread the word, please. Spread the word through social media, through word of mouth. Tell your friends, tell your family, because you truly deserve everything that we're trying to help you get. Thank you, so, so we want to. So I would like to present these to you because I look up to you. You are my inspiration. You are my hero. And you is what keep me going every morning. And you keep me doing what I have to do, fighting for justice and fighting for people who are facing inequalities today. So we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where's the petition? Where is it? Change.org. Everyone sign. It is also on the Facebook page, other people's organization for progress for all you social network heads in here. All of, all of my Facebook friends, I got 3,000 Facebook friends. We could double that tonight and just sign the petition. It's on my page, it's on our page, it's on Victoria's page. Right. Sound the drum, we could do this. To move a blade of grass is to change the world, sign the petition, change the world. Change.org. We don't have much time, and I'm not going to deny you all the opportunity to appreciate a living Shiro. Come on up here, Sister Pam Africa. Be on the move. It's really an honor to be here. When um, 
I had decided to come when I heard about you, and then I heard that Larry was going to be here. I didn't know he'd been running around everywhere, yeah. you know, all over the city, but he said, I'm going to be there if I have to be in the wheelchair. And I'm telling you, every demon that there is tried to block our way from coming here today. And of a sister, I want to let you know who I am. I'm Pam Africa, I'm Minister of Confrontation of the yes. Move Organization. Yes. Um, Chairwoman of the Uncompromising yes, right International Concerned right. Family and yes, Friends right. of Mumia yes, right. yes, right. And if you didn't know, the government dropped a bomb. That's right. That's Killed right. 11 yes. men, women, yeah. children That's of my right. family. We so we you know how you feel. Kill. I have a sister, Ramona Africa. When they dropped that bomb and set the place on fire, she came through there, came through a wall of fire. This is what the cop said, because she had a job to do. Yes. And the same person that saved you, yes. saved my sister. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, there's a reason. There's a reason why Larry is here today. There's a reason why Larry is here today. He's not finished. We all got work to do. And it's a reason why each and every last one of us is here today. I'm saying when we talk about miracles, that song, God, I'm looking for a miracle, a miracle. Right now, there's one, there's one, and all through this place is a miracle. It's a miracle that we stand here and continue to fight a demon such as today. I want to um, bring you up to date what's happening with Mumia and ask for your help. A lot of people was really, you know, um, happy that Munya came off of death row and now, you know, in, um, got life in prison without the possibility of parole, and a lot of people was relaxing. These people are determined to kill Munia, and they're looking for us to be relaxed, but we are always ready to jump and move and knock them suckers on down. When they open their mouth like the FOP did, talking about Mumia's a cop killer and they got um, the um, lawyer, Abadel, you know what I'm saying? You know, that wasn't a failure for us. It was a failure for them because once again, they showed themselves for who they are and showed us also people for who we thought they were and found out they wasn't. And all because Mumia was not defended by his attorneys, Mumia wasn't defended by a lot of organizations that should have stood up. The president of the United States, which is no friend of mine, and all you know, the president of the United States was attacked by the fraternal order police over someone he selected to become um, part of the Civil Rights Department. I didn't hear no groups and organizations howling and screaming and saying this is wrong until after two months when the battle was going on and we was thumping with them cops, we was thumping with them um, 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 government officials and stuff. Once the decision was made not to have Abadelli, Abadelli as the um, new attorney general up under Holder, then all of a sudden everybody got a microphone and seizures. I called them people the after the fact, mother suckers, mother suckers. And uh, they are after the fact. After the fact, they all got a microsophonic seizure and they're defending Abedelli. But they left out Mumia Abu Jamal because they wasn't after him. Oh, yes, they was for the civil rights vote. And uh, But Mumia, they was trying to take him down for the kill. And I was in the store and a young black, uh, um, a black woman approached me about my shirt. Oh, this is one of my favorites too. I wear this proudly, <laughs> yes. Um, but I have my Mumia shirt on. And, all, and this is a Mumia shirt as well, but I have Mumia's picture on this one. And a lady came up to me and she says, um, why are you wearing that cop killer shirt? I mean, it was a young black woman. She wasn't an FOP. She was a woman who read the paper and didn't understand what she did, under what she thought she understood was the um, black district attorney saying that Mumia's a cop killer. And uh, you know, and they um, that you know, Abbott Belly could have been our attorney general if we had not defended people like Hughes, had not defended that's her word. And uh, you know, this cop killer 
we were responsible for, Mumi was responsible for. I'm saying we got to set a record straight and all because we're fighting to get this brother out, not for him to live his life on, um, on slow death row. So look, the weekend, this year, like Larry, Mumia will be turned 60 years old. And we're not, ce we're celebrating the fact that Mumia lives. Mumia is alive despite all the demons that came forth to try to kill Mumia. I'm saying we're powerful, power to the people. We stop that um, right. um, death warrant. I'm saying we got to claim that with no lawyers, and uh, it was the people who stopped that. Um, but what I want to say, on the 24th, we're doing a fundraiser and uh, for the war chest for Mumia, and, uh, because it takes money to battle these people. Um, on the 24th, uh, Cornell West has devoted his time, uh, the last poets have devoted this time, and you know, jazz and musicians and things have devoted their time for a fundraiser in Philadelphia for Mumia. On the 25th, young artists from all across the country is coming into Philadelphia, which is Friday night. Mumia's birthday is a Thursday night. Friday night, young hip hop artists is coming because the power is in the pen. The power is in what we say and how we deliver it when we say it. Like the brother here, how he delivered us the information about what was happening with the sister. So these young hip hop artists with the power to draw more folks in and all uh, is having a concert and all uh, to help provide that war chest. On the 26th, we're taken to the streets from Captain Reggie Shell. He was the one who started the Black Panther movement in Philadelphia with then 14-year-old Mumia Abu-Jamal. At that location, at um, 19th and Cecil B. Moore, we formulating and we're going to march on from the church, of the, from Cecil B. Moore over to the Church of the Advocate. Why we march? We march because then it's during the time that the Panthers was getting started in the 60s, and uh, they was marching about jobs. We were marching about housing issues. We, now this urban uh, removal. We was marching about a lot of things that ill us, police brutality, the beating, the maintenance, and the killing of our people, the illegal jailers. We're marching, we're marching, and we're letting them know that we have not stopped, we will continue to stop, and we march because it's no way we won't sit back and allow you to kill Mumia Abu-Jamal. We're working to bring that brother up out of there. We're marching on that day, and uh, because we're honoring Bill Robinson, um, and then let, let me tell you this, I'm gonna wrap up, and I'm gonna pass out some flyers so that everybody can know what is going on. We need your help to participate in the march. Um, the Church of the Advocate, we're running the entire Church of the Advocate. We're shutting off from 18th to 19th Street on Diamond. We're taking Grant Street this way, Grant Street that way, and we're also taking Susquehanna Avenue. And uh, we're going to bring something up in there that people have never seen before. And uh, we have children, teaching children. So we're passing out the flyers, and please pick up the flyers and be a part of this movement to save the life of Mumia Abu-Jamal while we also fight to save ourselves. On the move, long live revolution, long live Larry Ham, long live all the sisters that received these awards tonight. Together, we will win. Power to the people. On the move, long live John Abu. On the move, sister. Susan, quickly, time is running. Yes. How's no. everybody doing this evening? No. Praise, God. Praise God. Praise God. We just want, in the in, in, uh, interest of time, we just want all the pop women to stand up and yes. we just want to say thank you. All the pop women of pop, please stand. All the women of pop, please stand. Please stand. Let's give them a hand and a round of applause because they do good work. And we want to thank them for that. And we, last but not least, we're going to bring back our co-chair, our chairman and co-chair to close you guys out. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for attending our annual Black History Women's Celebration. Thank you very, very much.
Brothers and sisters, thank you very much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Next Wednesday, power to the people. Everybody with me? Listen! Listen up, listen up. Please listen up, please. Chair got something to say to you. One second. Next Wednesday, April 2nd, we will be having another special program. Uh, our guest speaker next Wednesday, April 2nd, will be Dr. Cornell West. That will be at Bethany Baptist Church. That's 274 West Market Street in Newark, New Jersey, where Reverend William Howard is the pastor. We hope everybody will return for that forum. And he will speak on the importance of organization. <laughs> and lastly, I invite you tonight to join the People's Organization for Progress. Where the membership forms at? Are they in the back? They're in the back. Everybody get a membership form. Even if you're a member of other organizations, you can join POP. Brothers and sisters, thank you very much for coming out. Power to the people. Have a safe trip home. Give yourselves a hand before you leave, please.